Today we're finishing a series we've been calling That's a Red Flag. We've been talking about red flags in our relationships. And when our church first uh, built this building, we asked everybody to take markers and write prayers and the names of people that they would love to see uh, come to Jesus and grow in their faith. Um, when I had my marker, I asked sp very specifically where was going to be the spot where I was going to talk. And right below all of this padding, I wrote the verse James 3, 1. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers and sisters, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. And because of this, because of this commitment that, that I have made as a pastor and we have made as a church is that we talk about things whether you want to or not. So I have been dreading this whole week. Uh, but the Bible says um, in the book of 2 Tim or 2 Timothy chapter 4 uh, to preach in season and out of season, whether you want to or not, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, they will teach and want to hear what their itching ears want to hear. But you, on the other hand, speaking to all of us, keep your head in all situations. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge the duties of your ministry. So we're gonna do that today. And let me start by saying this. According to the Journal of Psychology and Christianity, as many as 65% of men and 55% of women will have an extramarital affair by the time they're 40. Let that sink in. Now, as a general rule, I don't trust surveys that give us statistics like this. One reason is they only will talk to 1,000 people and based on the responses of 1,000 people, they will say 329 million people in the United States behave this way, which is utter ridiculousness. The other reason I don't trust these surveys is that usually they will say things like 78% of Americans believe Nicolas Cage is a great actor, right? And we know what? That's not true, right? <laughs> Now, a clock is right, to, a broken clock is right two times a day. So we do know that he put out The Rock and Con Air. If you haven't seen those, you go see those. And uh, because at this church, we give all kinds of information to help your life get better. Did you see? Did you see Top Gun? Did you go see Top Gun? Jurassic Park? Don't see it. It's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> Trust me. Well... Um, not only am I the Michael Jordan of movie criticism, but I am skeptical of surveys. The one thing I'm not skeptical of is even if one person has an affair, it's like dropping battery acid on your kids and your spouse on all of your relationships, most importantly yourself. No one remains unaffected by an affair. Proverbs chapter 6, turn in your Bibles to that. For those of you who are new, what we do here in our services is that our church is composed of people that are making disciples all throughout the weeks, all throughout the week, and then we gather together as a community uh, to worship together as an entire community and to take a time where we listen to God's word. We're going to do that right now. Usually people don't carry Bibles on them, so we've developed an app that you can go to CCV Philadelphia, you can look it up, click the Bible tab, and it will bring you to our passage today, Proverbs chapter 6. Before I read it, I just want to say this. Proverbs is a book from a dad to a son. And so uh, if you're female, I want you to look at it, just reverse it from the perspective of a mother to a daughter. But if you were to t give some information about life to your son or to your daughter, what are you going to include in that? Well, Solomon, based on his life experience, spent the first four chapters talking about wisdom. And wisdom is knowing what to do, what God would have you do in every single situation. The first four chapters are on wisdom. And what do you think the next three chapters were on? Adultery. Think about that. 
that the very first thing that came to mind, we're in this relationship series, like what, why would we jump the gun and go immediately to that? Because there's no possible way that you can overemphasize what the Bible teaches on this in the way, this is like a massive red flag in relationships because what it does personally and what it does externally. So Proverbs chapter six, verse 20, let's start there. My son, Solomon is writing, keep your father's command and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Bind them always around your heart, fasten them around your neck. When you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you awake, they'll speak to you. For this command is a light, this teaching is a light, and correction and instruction are the way of life. Okay, Dad, great. What are you saying? Well, here. Keeping you from your neighbor's wife, from the smooth talk of a wayward woman or a wayward man. Do not lust in your heart after her beauty or let her captivate you with her eyes. For a prostitute can be had for a loaf of bread, but another man's wife preys on your very life. Can a man scoop fire in his lap without his clothes being burned? Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? So is he who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. People do not despise a thief if he steals to satisfy his hunger when he's starving. Yet if he is caught, he must pay sevenfold, though it cost him all the wealth of his house. But a man who commits adultery has no sense. Whoever does so destroys himself. Blows and disgrace are his lot, and his shame will never be wiped away. Verse 32 a man who commits adultery or a woman who commits adultery has no sense. Now, I've been a pastor for 33 years now, and I hear the same thing over and over again. People will say, like, I had no idea, honestly, what I was doing. Like, why? I, I, it was like I was temporarily insane or all reason went out the window or it was like I was drugged. I wasn't myself. And what they were trying to say is that they fully didn't appreciate the four consequences of an affair. And what I want to do is I want to make sure that we're not going to skirt this issue. We need to talk about this. And I know that there are people in this room that have had an affair. So hang with me, okay? It's important for us to talk about this and to be open as disciples of Jesus because the community of disciples... But just let, me, let me jump into this. Consequence number one... People didn't realize that the person you're having an affair with will be just as imperfect as your current spouse. When you're having an affair, you don't realize that, right? The reason they're so winsome and so exciting and so invigorating is because you haven't had to pick up his or her crap around the house for six years, all right? You don't have a relationship, you have a covert hookup, which is entirely in the shadows, which makes it very exciting if you're in a dry patch in your life. Consequence number two, if you have an affair, your kids will hate you. Your friends will say, ah, kids are resilient, they'll be fine. They say that because they're idiots. No, your kids will not be fine. This will devastate them for years. Just talk to disciples that are in this room that had their parents commit adultery and you ask them whether or not it just shape the trajectory of their life and their relationships. It won't be fine. It will affect their self-esteem. It will affect future relationships with their spouse. And it will make them, for some, question whether life is worth living. And so listen, when you have an affair, your whole family has the affair. You're dragging everybody into it. You're like, oh, I'll keep it a secret. No, you won't. Consequence number three, having an affair is like lighting yourself on fire and hoping it burns your spouse. Not that everybody is having an affair out of revenge, some do, but all affairs will stem from selfish behavior that will just crush your partner. Look again at verse 32 and 33. A man who commits adultery has no sense. Whoever does so destroys himself, blows in disgrace or his lot, and his shame will never be wiped away. 
Now, at this point, I realize that there are people in the room or are watching at home where you've had affairs and you listen to this and you're feeling pretty bad right now. And it honestly, it sucks each time you're reminded of what you did and you're wondering when we're going to get to the God makes everything better part. Please help me feel better about myself. We're not there yet. There's one more consequence. Consequence number four is God's judgment on your sin. A lot of people think, oh, an affair is between a man and a woman. No, an affair is between two people, their family and their God, whether they believe in that God or not. And saying that you don't believe in this God will not keep you from reaping the consequences of this behavior. I'm going to read two verses to, to you, and you tell me whether they're from the New Testament or Old Testament. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who don't know God, and that in this matter no one should, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. New Testament or Old Testament? Sounds like the Old Testament, doesn't it? New Testament scriptures. In other words, what the Apostle Paul, and more than likely, we don't know who wrote um, Hebrews. I think it was quite possibly Aquila. Didn't keep her name on it because it was a patriarchal culture. If you commit adultery after you become a Christian, God will forgive you, but you will be judged. God is going to judge you for your sin. And you're saying, wait, if I'm a Christian, you're telling me that God is going to do something harmful to me. That is exactly what the Bible is saying. And I can tell you, after 33 years of being a pastor, this is exactly what I've seen. When Christians have an affair, God will do terrible things to you in judgment for that sin. Remember our passage, Proverbs 6, 27. Can a man scoop fire in his lap without his clothes being burned? Can a man walk on hot coals without his feet being scorched? So is he who sleeps with another man's wife. No one who touches her will go unpunished. Churches never talk about this. They lie to people. This, that passage that we're talking about is not just the vengeance of a spouse. It's God exacting his vengeance upon your sin. But there's one thing that we can do about it, repentance. Repentance means that we break off the affair and ask God and our spouse for forgiveness that will prevent God's judgment from happening. Repentance is not just saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is ending the affair. That you will leave this conversation that we're having and you will break it off now. Now, what is God's judgment? I don't know. I truly don't know. It's different for every person. I do know in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, in the early church, that two people had something terrible happen to them from God. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died, and then the young man came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized, not the Old Testament, the church and all who heard about these events. And for those of you who have been cheated on, you're thinking, yeah, that's about right, death. Death, that's pretty good. Surely you felt that way. Now, God is not in the murdering business anymore. That has more to do with the miracle working power of Peter. But God is still in the judgment business. Everybody that wants to turn Jesus 
into this left-wing socialist hippie going through the field telling people to give money to the poor and he's going to hug you and everything is going to be fine. You have never read the Gospels. We talked about this in the Revelation Understood series, what God's judgment looks like in the 21st century. Romans chapter 1 very specifically says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. And then he gives an example. Therefore, God, kata alasso, it says in Greek, turned them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. You want, so very specifically, what God's judgment is against adultery is God's judgment is he lets us keep doing what we're doing. That's God's judgment. Wait, you're saying he's not going to strike you? me dead? Yeah. He's not going to intervene and like, man, like miraculously. No. If you're a disciple of Jesus and you are choosing to enter in and defile yourself and your vows, God will say, go ahead. That is God's judgment. People will think, oh, I got caught having an affair. God is judging me. No. A Christian getting caught in an affair is a sign of God's mercy, not his judgment. God's judgment is if you keep having an affair and you will not repent, he will let you screw up all of your future relationships. He will let you screw up your kids' future relationships and their kids' kids' future relationships. God's judgment is he will allow you to wreck the lives of dozens of people because of your selfishness and not feel bad about it. You get to watch for years the unfolding painful consequences of your selfishness played out in the lives of those you love most knowing that you did that to them. That is significantly worse than having God kill you and have you drop dead. In the Bible, it says in Numbers 14, 18, the Lord is slow to anger, abounding love and forgiving sin and rebellion, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. He lets you affect your great grandkids. Your grandmother had an affair which affected her daughter, your mother. She either hated her or it affected the way she viewed her sexuality. It distorted her understanding of relationships which then affected you and now it's going to affect your kids and their kids. You tell me that's not the judgment of God? As Hebrews 10.31 says, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now the good news. The good news of Jesus is that those who repent can avert God's wrath and then have availed to themselves the power of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit to begin to transform to heal and to redeem. That's why Jesus came. It doesn't save us from the consequences, but it can mitigate a lot of the, lot of the consequences. If we're honest. So what is repentance? Repentance is breaking off the affair and asking God and our spouse for forgiveness. John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's us and him. But it's the work of the Holy Spirit now that we have to go back and do the repairing work. 
So what I want to do right now is I'm going to lead all of us through a process of repentance. And I'm not asking you to bow your head and close your eyes. I just want you to listen and I want you to pray along in your head. I'm going to lead us in prayer where I'm going to give you the words and we're going to say these words to God. God, first, we repent of the affairs that we've had in our hearts. Every single person in this room has had an affair with someone in their heart where no one could see it. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 27, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in her heart. No one in this room and no one at home does not have the stain of adultery on them. All of us carry this. So tell God right now that you are sorry, that you have been unfaithful to him, that you have broken your marriage vows in your heart, you have defiled yourself with someone else. If you are single, you are repenting of lust and premarital sex. Tell God that you deserve his judgment. You deserve for him to do nothing, but you plead for his mercy and intervention. Next, God, we repent for not having clear safeguards in place. Every person in this room and at home is going places and doing things that they need to check and ask themselves. Is there anything I need to do to switch, to check, to change? All of us need to do an audit of the potential pitfalls that could lead us into adultery. Ephesians 4, 27, do not give the devil a foothold. Yet people in this room and at home go places after work and spend time with people that they know they shouldn't. They allow themselves to linger in conversations with people that they know they're tempted by, they have no business talking to. Going on business trips without clear boundaries and accountability. Setting up meetings with people they're attracted to that they know they have no business meeting alone with. Talking about their marriage problems with someone of the opposite sex. Staying friends with former boyfriends and girlfriends and former spouses on social media. Using their phones to watch porn. Having social media accounts that their spouses do not have access to. Time that is not accounted for. Phones that their spouses know nothing about. Passwords that their spouses do not know. Tell God right now that you Repent, you are sorry, that you have been unfaithful to him, that you are stopping these things today, that you have broken your marriage vows in your heart and with someone else, that you deserve his wrath, you deserve his judgment, but you are pleading for his intervention because you are leaving here today and you're going to burn those bridges. Friend of mine, as an accountability partner and his password on his phone, he and his accountability partner know the password that's on his phone and the password that's on his computer and the passwords that's for, that, that is the password for all of his accounts and his password is faithful. Finally, God, we repent for affairs we're having right now. We ask for your forgiveness for our utter selfishness, for putting our family and our relationships in harm's way, for seeking the counsel of people who do not follow your truth so that we can feel justified, seeking counsel from people whose minds are deluded from the world who don't follow and submit themselves to the authority of Scripture for the ways we parade our sin before your eyes, for the reckless disregard of the consequences of our behavior, tell God right now, we're sorry. 
that you've been unfaithful to him, that you're breaking off it, off the affair right now. Repentance is not saying I'm sorry. Repentance is not committing the adultery again. That's repentance. Metanoia is the change of mind and direction. It's not just meaningless words that we say to make ourselves religiously feel better. Tell God right now that you deserve his wrath, but you're pleading for his mercy and forgiveness. The good news of Jesus is that every single one of us in this room are dripping with the sin that we have created, the decisions that we've made, and the brokenness that we have inherited. The gospel is, is that God's spirit can come and live inside of us, bring forgiveness, bring hope, bring healing, and help us to remake our minds and our hearts to the, so that we become like him. The gospel means this is what Jesus would do if he had an affair and he was you in your situation. That's the gospel. What would he do? Our Heavenly Father, we're so incredibly thankful that as a community of disciples that have placed our minds and our hearts under your authority, that you offer to give us mercy not just for the one-time event of salvation that we have received that is not based on our works, but the continued forgiveness that we need to receive afterwards, regardless of what it is. We pray that we would become like you in holiness so that our relationships will be the kinds of relationships that we all want the kinds of relationships where you're in control, where you bring healing and you bring grace. We pray that you would make this happen and continue to make it happen in our community. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.